Welcome to today's video on how to get amazing deep sleep. Sleep is absolutely essential for our physical and mental well-being, and deep sleep, particularly responsible for physical recovery and repair, is absolutely key to feeling your tip top on a daily basis. In this video, I'm going to be sharing with you guys some tips and tricks on how to achieve the best that deep sleep you possibly can do on a daily basis, and at the end of the video, so be sure to stick around, I'll be reviewing an example of my client's sleep metrics to break down how exactly we improve their quality of sleep and what we look for when we are tracking an individual's sleep through a tool like an Aura Ring, which I'm wearing right here. Okay, so first and foremost, we're gonna dive into sticking to a consistent routine and schedule. This is absolutely paramount when it comes to improving your quality of sleep, and it's something which most individuals tend to neglect the importance of. So for the individuals that I work with specifically, I make sure that they are going to sleep at the exact same time on a daily basis, and they're waking up the exact same time on a daily basis, or within an hour range or so. Now this does not mean that they're doing so Monday through to Friday and on the weekends having a lie-in or they're going to bed late, going out, etc. The individuals that I work with in order to improve their quality of sleep do this seven days per week. It is absolutely key. In terms of planning your sleep start and end times, you want to take into account a few factors. Of course, work commitments will play into this, going out, having a social life, etc. All the, all the above. But the most important thing we're paying attention to is ensuring that you spend approximately nine hours in bed per night on a daily basis. The reason being for this is because most individuals have an awake time of approximately half an hour to an hour per night, meaning they're actually awake for about an hour per night without really knowing it. And the only way you can be aware of that is by actually tracking your sleep quality through a metric device like an Aura Ring or a Whoop Band. Okay, so allocating for nine hours in bed per night is absolutely key and is fundamental to ensuring your sleep quality improves moving forward. Making sure they're consistent in terms of your sleep start and end times is of paramount importance. The second tip and trick is to be making sure you actually adhere to somewhat of a relaxing evening schedule. Now, I'm not a massive advocate of evening routines as such, something which you have to follow step by step, all intricacies and details. I don't really believe that's sustainable long term and therefore I don't actually incorporate them myself, nor the people I work with to improve their quality of sleep. So what I would advise instead is reverse engineering this as follows. What I pay attention to personally is I know for a fact I'm going to bed at approximately 10 p.m. every single night and therefore, in the three hours prior to bed, I need to start to wind down, decompress, relax, etc. The way I facilitate that firstly is by making sure I consume my last meal of the day, so my dinner, approximately three to four hours prior to bed. The reason being for doing so is to ensure my heart rate is actually not elevated and actually starts to descend towards my sleep start time, which encourages a better quality of sleep and also helps regulate my body temperature more effectively. Once that's done, I then switch off from all work responsibilities. I'm not spending my time on the computer, I'm not on client calls, I'm not doing follow up, I'm not communicating with anyone. I have that time to switch off. So that's from approximately 7 p.m., knowing that I want to be in bed and sleep by 10 p.m. That time is for me to unwind. I do so in the following way. First and foremost, generally speaking, I consume my dinner, I then go for a post prandial walk. So, post meal walk, which helps me digest my food and therefore also helps me decompress my thoughts from the day, kind of review how things went, what could be improved, what could be refined. And basically just evaluate where I'm at with things on a daily basis, which is really, really important for me in order to process ruminating thoughts. So I go for a walk, we have a common here, which is really nice. I go for a 60 minute walk, listen to an audio book, really helpful, get some fresh air, very, very nice. And prevents me from being on my laptop or my computer in the hours prior to bed. That brings me home to about two hours left prior to bed, so about 8 p.m. more or less. What I would personally recommend doing, and again, most individuals maybe don't have the access to this, but if you do, you can incorporate this. I'd incorporate heat exposure in the form of a sauna. Okay, now the reason being for this, and it's something I've been doing religiously for the past four years, is to elevate your core body temperature, and as a result of that, your body naturally will want to expel heat, meaning in the hours in which you are asleep, your core body temperature is cooler and encourages a better quality of sleep. It's really beneficial. If you don't have access to a sauna, and again, most people don't, so that's absolutely fine, you can incorporate a hot shower or a hot bath. That's absolutely fine. Of course, your body temperature will not be elevated to such an extent it would be in a sauna, but anyhow, it's not the end of the world. Raising your core body temperature through that process is what's key, really. Now, once that's done, I try to avoid blue light and artificial light sources as best as possible. And this is primarily in the hour prior to bed now. As opposed to watching Netflix or watching YouTube videos, etc., which, again, is something which you can't necessarily avoid at all times. What I personally rather do is listen to some music, read a book, and that's how I personally decompress. However, I do appreciate that if you're with your partner, you're with your friends, etc., you may want to be watching some TV, a YouTube video, you want to be a normal human being, not a robot. Absolutely fine. The best way to mitigate the impact of blue light is to make sure that the light sources around you are dimmed. Okay, so in my apartment, we have these lights which do dim, which is really great. And also, if you are watching a bright screen, you can wear blue light blocking glasses as well to prevent the impact of the blue light from interfering with the melatonin secretion, which will, of course, massively negatively impact your sleep quality. 
we all have those nights we've been on our phone, our laptop in bed, etc. We feel like we're buzzing, like we can't sleep, we've got no inclination to do so. And that's a hormonal response as a result of melatonin not being secreted, being prevented from being secreted by artificial light sources, which sucks because your body's thinking, oh, this is light, it's like the sunshine, I should be awake right now, I should be functioning, etc. That sucks. And of course, in the 21st century, in the society we're currently in, and everyone's very work focused and ambitious, etc. Everyone's working right until the hours they go to bed or watching TV or whatever. So if you can really alleviate that as best as possible, that would be awesome. My third tip to focus on is making sure your sleep environment is as cool as possible. Again, this is something which I notice is most difficult for the male clients I work with as opposed to female clients, as a result of their body temperature naturally being a little bit higher, or at least they feel like it's a little bit higher. Um, so maybe if you step with a partner, your partner's kind of pulling the duvet over her and she's wanting to wrap up and get a little bit warm and she's complaining about how cold she is and you're sat there like boiling hot, sweating one out in bed, which sucks, right? It's very negative and very deleterious when it comes to your sleep quality. So making sure your sleep environment is as cool as possible is great. If you have air conditioning, I'd encourage you to actually set at 18 degrees Celsius, that'd be appropriate. If you don't have air conditioning and you're in an older apartment or you're in a house, whatever it may be, you can open the window and make sure it's ventilating the room in the hours prior to bed. If, of course, that creates noise disturbance from the environment surrounding you, then that's gonna be deleterious to your sleep quality also. That will wake you up, it's not gonna be great, okay? So the way I would negate that, we by purchasing a tool like a chili pad or something which can cause the mattress temperature, like an eight sleep pod pro. There's plenty of devices, they're air cooling systems which you can put on your bed and also in your duvet, your mattress, etc. And they help you better regulate your body temperature at night, which of course is very conducive for a better quality of sleep. Now, these tools are really cool as well, like an eight sleep pod pro, a chili pad, etc. because you can actually change the temperature from each side of the bed. Meaning if your partner's cooler, you can heat her side of the bed up. If you're really hot, hot and you're really warm, and you're really bothered and you're agitated by the heat, you can cool yourself down, which is great. They are very conducive tools to improving your sleep quality. They are quite expensive. Not everyone can afford them. And you can also actually purchase gel pads instead, which you would place on top of the mattress, which just cools your body temperature down a little bit. My fourth hack is a really simple one, but is one that again, almost every individual I speak to about their quality of sleep absolutely avoids and neglects and just doesn't pay attention to, which is terrible is consistent daylight and sunlight exposure. Now, I do appreciate that if you're in Western, or if you're in Western countries or in Europe, our winters are bleak, they're very dark, they're very cold, it's, it's not particularly great. When you're getting out of bed, it's dark, etc. It doesn't feel brilliant, right? But if you can do so, particularly in the winter months specifically, getting as much sunlight exposure as you possibly can do is really, really, really important when it comes to establishing your set circadian rhythm function, okay? So if you were to get up and out of bed and you were to expose yourself to natural sunlight, immediately your body recognizes that as being an indication that the day is starting, you should get going, etc. And therefore that's your set point for the start of the day. If you then expose yourself to natural sunlight throughout the day, particularly as the sun starts to set, your body's then thinking, okay, cool, I need to start to unwind, I need to start actually producing melatonin to improve my quality of sleep. And as a result of that, it will set your circadian rhythm nicely. Fifth tip is also to avoid any stimulating activities and regulate your caffeine intake on a daily basis. I'd very much discourage you from consuming any caffeine in an eight hour window prior to bed. It's gonna massively negatively impact your sleep quality as a result of the extended half-life of caffeine, which is about eight hours to 10 hours depending on the individual and their response, and also the amount they have consumed in those hours also. Okay, so in the same way that we don't want to incorporate any vigorous activity in the hours prior to bed, like a late evening workout, for example, an hour prior to bed, which gets you an endorphin high, you feel rushed, you feel pumped, your heart rate's elevated, etc. you feel like you're good to go, you're motivated to work, etc. We don't want to incorporate caffeine in the eight hours prior to bed also. It's an absolute paramount importance. Also another variable to take into account, which I think most people tend to neglect actually, and it's a really simple one again, is water consumption, right? So again, we're always encouraged to hydrate ourselves, fuel ourselves with water, etc., on a daily basis and get enough in. As a result of being encouraged to do so, most people start to consume their water throughout the day, maybe progressively towards the evening hours, which as a result encourages them to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, which is very deleterious to sleep quality once again. So the way I think about this and the way I reverse engineer it is I front load my water intake. So I consume approximately about three liters, maybe just under three liters prior to 1 p.m., 2 p.m. And then from there, my 1.5 liters after that, so 4.5 liters total throughout the day, is consumed in the latter eight to 10 hours of the day progressively. And I start to taper that off prior to bed to ensure that I don't need to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, which as a result exposed me to bright light by turning the lights on, I'm getting stimulated, feel like I'm waking up again, my sleep goes to as a result of that. Very simple one, but really easy hack to incorporate also. Okay, so now as I referred to at the start of the video, I'm gonna analyze one of my client's sleep metrics with you guys in real time, show you how I would actually reflect on or look at an individual sleep metrics. They're tracked by a tool like an Aura Ring or a Whoop Band. In this instance, this individual that I work with actually uses an Aura Ring. I believe it to be much more preferable or much more accurate as opposed to a Whoop Band. This is in my opinion, the most accurate tool. I've been using this now for about six, seven years. 
I actually supply this to all of my clients that I work with as well, as opposed to Whoop Band, which in my opinion isn't as accurate. And also I just don't like the, uh, the user interface as much either personally. Okay, cool. So on screen, we're gonna look at a few variables. So as you can see here, this is a night of sleep tracked on the 12th of January, first Thursday, 12th of January. So up above, we have a few metrics, a few key metrics initially, which is your readiness score and your sleep score. Now this is reflective of how well you are ready to, or rather how well recovered you are to perform that day and how well you are primed to perform physically that day, your readiness score specifically, and your sleep score being reflective of course your sleep quality in the nights prior. We're now gonna look on the left side of the screen here and look at total sleep. This is total sleep duration. This is not time spent in bed. As I said at the start of the video, most individuals have about 30 minutes to an hour of awake time per night, even actually progressing up to an hour and a half, two hours in some instances, as a result of sleep quality, which could be improved and refined or other external variables like noise, environment disturbances, maybe body temperature regularities, your partner moving, dog barking, whatever it may be, that very much encourages heightened wait time. Okay, so it's a total sleep. Again, what we're gonna look at here in the central column here is the variables as follows, REM sleep, deep sleep, efficiency, restfulness, latency, and timing. Now, most people that are looking to improve their quality of sleep, hence the title of this video, are looking to acquire deep sleep. And they actually have no idea what REM sleep is, nor its importance and the role it plays in the day-to-day -day foundation of how you perform cognitively. Okay, so REM sleep and deep sleep are totally different things. REM sleep is responsible for your cognitive performance and memory function in terms of how you process, obviously, your prior experiences, key information, etc and your ability to perform cognitively in a sharp manner the next day. Deep sleep being responsible for physical repair and recovery. So of course, how you are performing or responding to training stimulus, whether it be workouts, cardio, whatever it may be, how you actually recover and how you feel on a daily basis. So both variables are very, very important, okay? I'm now gonna dive into a couple of other metrics like latency. Latency is indicative of how long it takes you to fall asleep that night specifically. So this individual specifically fell asleep in 14 minutes, which is pretty healthy range, okay? We're now gonna look at their sleep stages. So again, as you can see, this person went to bed at 11, 10 p.m. and woke up at 7, 4, uh, 54, meaning that this person had one hour and 27 minutes of awake time, which is pretty high, and it's something which I'll be addressing with him moving forward in order to improve his quality of sleep. The reason why we pay attention to awake time specifically is because if it's heightened or lengthy in duration, it can actually contradict the acquisition or rather prevent the acquisition of REM sleep, which is again, really important to cognitive function Specifically, if you're a business person like the clients I work with, wanting to perform at a high level on a daily basis, be a team, communicate with clarity, uh, regulate your emotions as best as possible. These are really important variables associated to REM sleep, which would be negatively impacted or basically totally subsided or prevented from being acquired as a result of heightened awake time. Okay, so in this instance, this individual's acquired one hour thirty of REM sleep. Now. Majority of your REM sleep will be acquired in the last 25% of your sleep duration. Hence why it's so important and why the recommendation of getting eight hours of sleep per night is one which I would actually advise and encourage. Most individuals that get six hours of sleep per night, for example, maybe even five hours, are of course actually preventing themselves from acquiring this whole section of REM sleep here, an hour long of REM sleep phase, which means cognitively and also from an emotional perspective, they feel lethargic, tired, they're dealing with negative thoughts, maybe a little bit depressed, sad, etc., and they can't perform particularly well when it comes to communicating their thoughts in a concise and effective manner, nor recalling memories, which of course impacts your work, relationships, basically everything in life. So it's really, really important to pay attention to. Again, again, that's acquired in the last primarily 25% of your sleep duration. So in this instance, eight hours of sleep time, last two hours of sleep. Okay. Deep sleep, as you can see, is acquired a lot earlier on. And in this instance, this individual's acquired one hour 48, which is very, very good. The optimal we're looking for here really is about two hours, two hours 30. That varies from person to person, isn't an absolute to aim for. This individual one hour 48 minutes is absolutely fine for sure. We now look at heart rate. And again, this is really important because heart rate is indicative of regulation of circadian rhythm. Okay, basically your secretion of melatonin to make you fall asleep and cortisol to get you up alert, active first thing upon waking, supposed to feeling groggy, lethargic, and like you don't want to get out of bed, right? So it's really, really important. And we know if someone's circadian rhythm has been well aligned and is regulated properly by seeing a somewhat U-shaped curve. It's not gonna be a perfect U-shaped curve. Your heart rate will vary at certain points throughout the night. But in this instance, this individual's sleep, or rather heart rate, does infer the circadian rhythm is well aligned. As a result, their lowest heart rate being recorded just prior to 2 a.m. And their heart rate starting to accelerate as they wake up, meaning their core body temperature is increasing and their body is naturally secreting cortisol to wake them up and ensure they feel energized highly alert, ready to function first thing upon waking. So that is great. Another variable we pay attention to is respiratory rate. So most individuals that have a heightened respiratory rate, generally speaking, are mouth breathers and they're not breathing from uh, the nasal passages, which again is actually very deleterious to their sleep quality. 
So this individual being one of them, and therefore I've actually sent him out mouth tape to put across his mouth, which encourages nasal breathing, which we'll see progression of over time. Uh, in terms of the deceleration of his respiratory rate, it's currently 16.3 breaths per minute, which is a little bit too high. I'd rather aim for like 15, 14.5. And temperature deviation also, which infers or rather gives us an early warning sign as to whether or not an individual is actually coming down with sickness. It could be coming down with a flu, a cough, a cold, anything in terms of feeling a little bit worn down, run down, etc. Temperature deviation informs us of this happening in the, the hours prior to, so maybe 24 hours prior to, it gives us a good indication, a little bit of a heads up. So in this instance, this individual's temperature is, as you can see, 0.2 degrees Celsius. Anything above 0.5, 6, 7, etc generally speaking, would infer very much to the heart rate, or rather their body temperature is increasing, they're probably getting a little bit run down, a little bit ill, a little bit sick, so we need to pay attention to that as well. And I'll click through to the readiness section, and this is the smaller part of this uh, analysis. And as we can see here, we're looking at lowest resting heart rate, 45 BPM, so that's very healthy from an aerobic perspective, and is very much indicative of good cardiovascular health. And HRV, which is actually just a metric recorded between heartbeats, which would infer your quality of recovery, the higher HRV generally, the higher recovery. So my HRV, approximately on a daily basis, is 120 MS. This individual is 52. That's not a bad HRV by any means. There are set points from each individual that we work with, but of course, the higher the better. And if we can progressively increase that by removing inflammatory food sources, stresses, both physical and psychologically, psychological stresses, which actually impede your ability to recover and perform daily, then we'll do so, right? Very simple. So it could be food sources, as I said, it could be make sure you get your gut health tested, it could be a bad relationship you're in, it could be work stresses that all impact your HRV, so we need to pay attention to that also. So that's just a brief analysis of my client's sleep metrics here in Aura. I would very much encourage all of you guys that are wanting to improve your quality of sleep to use a metric device to track your quality of sleep. In the same way that in order to determine your state of your finances, you look at your banking app, you've got to see the metric data associated to your sleep to determine if it's good or bad, if there's room for improvement. Very, very simple. By following these tips, you can drastically improve your likelihood and chances of acquiring a deep, restful sleep on a daily basis. Remember, the absolute key is consistency and making sleep a priority in your daily routine and weekly routine. Thanks for watching. If you guys enjoyed the video, make sure you subscribe, leave the video a thumbs up, and any questions you guys have, drop them for me in the comment section below, and I'll do my best to reply to all of them for you guys.